All at it's an only mode. Hi everyone, thanks for joining our Clarion Project webinar. Uh, my name is Ryan Morrow and I'm the National Security Analyst for the Clarion Project. We are a nonpartisan educational group focusing on tracking radical Islam around the world, but especially here in the United States. Uh, you probably know us from our films, Obsession, The Third Jihad, and one that is particularly relevant to today, Iranium. And we would like to let you know that if you go to clarionproject.org, you can watch our film, Iranium, for free. Uh, so you can send that to your friends and family members and really alert them to not just the threat from Iran, but also the threat from what we're going to be talking about today, which is EMP, electromagnetic pulse. I'm very happy to have Dr. Peter Vincent Pry with us today. He's one of the top experts in EMP. He served on the Congressional EMP Commission. He's the executive director of the Task Force on National and for the Congressional Caucus for EMP and the director of the U.S. Nuclear Strategy Forum. So there are few people, if any, that would be more well qualified to talk about this and give us this briefing than Dr. Pry. And so I thank him for taking time out of his day in order to educate us about this and give us this expert briefing. And so without further ado, uh, Dr. Pry, you can take it away. Ryan, thank you for that generous introduction, and I thank the Clarion Project for uh, uh, giving me uh, an opportunity to address a broad audience about the existential threat that is electromagnetic pulse, uh, which is uh, uh, which is probably the most serious threat, in my judgment, that faces our civilization. The briefing today is titled, Have Concessions to Iran Made a Nuclear Electromagnetic Pulse Attack More Likely? We're going to talk about the threat broadly, the EMP threat broadly, but we're particularly interested in, in Iran today because of the recent uh, Geneva interim agreement that has been so much in the press. Uh, this is more about my background. Ryan already gave me a great introduction. I just want to say I've been working in the field of weapons of mass destruction all my professional life. I started at the CIA and then later served on the House Armed Services Committee, several congressional commissions. And of all the threats I've examined, uh, you know, EMP is the one that concerns me most because it is the one that is least understood and can do the most damage to our society. We altered the title of this briefing again to focus on Iran because of the Geneva Interim Agreement that we must address. People might get the impression that, uh, uh, that uh, the, the agreement offers a realistic pathway uh, for escaping not just the nuclear threat from Iran but the EMP threat, which is uh, uh, even more important to understand. Uh, because Iran has to get only one bomb to pose an existential threat to this country. And I'm going to be getting false hope from the Geneva Interim Agreement. What is an EMP? An electromagnetic pulse is a super energetic radio wave, far more powerful than lightning, than can, that can inflict thousands of volts per meter on, uh, on electronics everywhere on the surface of the Earth and airplanes flying over the Earth and even in things underwater, including intercontinental cables that travel underwater. Uh, the EMP can be caused by the sun, it be, can, can be caused by a nuclear weapon, it can be caused by non-nuclear weapons. In effect, uh, with the nuclear EMP and a solar EMP, the damage can be extremely widespread. A nuclear weapon detonated at high altitude above 30 kilometers above the Earth can inflict damage over a huge area. Uh, at the proper altitude, you could cover the United States. And a solar flare from the sun, the rare geomagnetic superstorm, could cause the collapse of electric grids and critical infrastructures everywhere on Earth. Radio frequency weapons is a non-nuclear way of making EMP. The danger here is that uh, you can build these out of Radio Shack parts. There are EMP simulators that can be purchased they're not intended as weapons, but they can be used as weapons, and they can be purchased by anyone without a license. And we've arrived at a place for the first time in our history where terrorists or, uh, or uh, a criminal or, or a madman could purchase or build a radio frequency weapon and, and topple the technological pillars of a major metropolitan area, and so black out a whole city, for example, all on his own. Depicted here is the national power grid, which is subdivided into three portions, the western, the Texas grid and the eastern grid. 
The most important of these is the Eastern Grid, which is where 70% of U.S. electricity is generated. Eastern Grid, you've basically lost the whole of society. You know, the country can't sustain with, with the loss of 70% of its electricity, even if the Western Texas grids remain intact. And you can detonate a nuclear weapon at such altitude, as shown here, so that you could cover the whole country with an EMP at the proper burst height. Here, 500 kilometers, even a lower altitude, 400 kilometers could do it. And you'd put the EMP down on all 48 contiguous states, including large parts of Texas and Mexico. And all the electronics could be damaged or destroyed you know, within that area, causing the collapse of critical infrastructures, especially the, the electric grid, which is the keystone critical infrastructure. We are an electronic civilization. Everything depends on electricity, and we cannot survive without it. And eventually, within a matter of days, all the other uh, critical infrastructures, telecommunications, uh, banking and finance, food and water, all the things needed to support of 310 million people to sustain a modern society uh, would collapse as a consequence of an EMP event, whether it's from a nuclear weapon or the sun. Here are some of the estimates of the consequences of an EMP. The com EMP commission on which I served calculated uh, that given our current state of unpreparedness, and we are unprepared because our electric grid and other critical infrastructures are all utterly vulnerable to EMP, uh, the EMP commission calculated we could lose two-thirds of the U.S. population, 200 million, million Americans uh, would die within a year of an EMP event that caused a year-long blackout from starvation, disease, and societal collapse. Uh, other estimates, the EMP Commission was actually criticized for being too optimistic, and other credible estimates, uh, also embraced by the, endorsed by the EMP Commission, uh, are that uh, the casualties would be much higher. Nine of ten Americans could die, because that first estimate were 200 million Americans starve to death. You know, we assumed that people, we looked at what the society could support in the absence of the electric grid. How many people could the society support before there was an electric grid? And if you go back to 1900, you know, we had a population of about 100 million Americans. And so we figured that was the natural carrying capability of the land. Uh, but Fritz Ehrmarth, uh, who was a brilliant man, former chairman of the National Intelligence Council, cautioned that uh, those Americans back in 1900 they were basically pioneers. 75% of them were farmers. They knew how to hunt and fish and live off the land. That's not true of modern Americans. And so uh, Fritz's estimate, which endorsed by uh, Chairman Graham, who was the chairman of the EMP Commission, are that given a year after an EMP event that collapses the critical infrastructures, 9 of 10 Americans could, uh, could perish. It's basically a high-tech way of killing millions of people the old-fashioned way through starvation, disease, and anarchy. Communications could be not just significantly impacted, but almost utterly destroyed as a result of an EMP because they are so dependent on microelectronics and, uh, and, and the electric grid. Uh, some telecommunications, key things like cell phone towers, have backup batteries and emergency generators and things, but only enough energy to last for about 72 hours. After 72 hours, those emergency generators run out of fuel, the batteries run down, and basically you end up with total system collapse. Financial systems. Uh, we're an electronic economy. Uh, the people don't even use money anymore so much as they use credit cards. Uh, wealth is, uh, is transferred and purchases made electronically. In the absence of the electronics, when you uh, get the total blackout and the destruction of these systems, money becomes worthless and uh, we could revert to a primitive barter economy. So dire would the consequences be. Other vital services, transportation would be paralyzed, oil and gas supplies stopped. There wouldn't be any running water immediately to supply. And people wouldn't even be able to drink out of lakes and streams. You can't even do that now, even when they're in relatively pristine condition compared to the Pope. You know, you risk your life by taking a drink out of the Potomac River, for example, today. But in the aftermath of an EMP, it would be far worse. One of the things we find that happens is that wastewater treatment plants, for example, back up into rivers and streams and lakes, and industrial pollutants, human waste, hospital wastes, backflow into those waters uh, so that it would become much more dangerous to try to get water that way. And there wouldn't be any water going into the major, uh, major cities. Anyone who would be dependent on running water you know, would, would, would be it without that. How do you lose the food supply? Well, the food supply has to be, has to be transported into grocery stores, which only have about a 72-hour supply for the local population. And we also require temperature control systems to preserve the food, like refrigerators and things. You know, 
uh, about 72 hours after an AMP, the food would start to rot. And we don't have seasick food supplies to support our population uh, for weeks or months. Uh, you know, people would start to starve to death uh, with uh, the EMP grid and transportation systems in paralysis. An EMP can be caused, I mentioned earlier, not just by a nuclear weapon, but also by the sun. This is done by what are called coronal mass ejections, or more popularly, solar flares. And they happen every year. Uh, EMP, natural EMPs happen every year. The geomagnetic storms are a common occurrence in countries at high northern latitudes, like Russia, the Nordic countries, Alaska. Uh, when these things happen, we often uh, reroute airline traffic, because satellites uh, and, uh, and guidance uh, that provide guidance to airliners are, are, are harmed. And, uh, and uh, airliners are at risk at those high northern latitudes. And they even cause ha uh, havoc sometimes with uh, telecommunications and uh, power grids. There is a run-of-the-mill geomagnetic storm that called a hydro in 1989 that uh, hit further south, and uh, it blacked out half of Canada for a day, caused billions of dollars of damage, some lives were lost, people couldn't get to the hospitals. So that kind of natural EMP does happen all the time. What the EMP Commission was concerned about and uh, what we are concerned about here is the rare geomagnetic superstorm. These occur about once a century. The last one was in 1859 called the Carrington event. These are much more powerful than these normal geostorms. And when they occur, we're, about a, uh, we're overdue for one of these. Uh, it would collapse electric grids everywhere on Earth and put billions of lives at stake. Uh, and we know that these things occur quite regularly. Um, you know, because of looking at the historical record. It's just that in the past, in 1859, it was the horse and bucky days, and people were not, uh, their lives did not depend upon the electric grid. Uh, you know, there wasn't any electric grid. There were just telegraph communications, and those that existed, those primitive communications, burst into flame. Uh, stations were burned down. Forest fires occurred because of uh, burning telegraph cables. The transatlantic cable that had just been laid in 1859, the pulse from the Carrington event was so powerful it reached into the depths of the Atlantic Ocean and destroyed that cable. Imagine if something like that happened today when we're so dependent on, uh, on electricity. Um, the National Academy of Sciences estimated that if there was a recurrence of a lesser solar storm called the Railroad Storm of 1921, which was also before electricity became really widespread in society, that didn't happen until the Roosevelt administration, but if the Railroad Storm occurred, this was only one-tenth as powerful as the Carrington event. And it would cause a blackout in the United States that would probably last four to ten years. Let's look at a little more detail at an EMP attack from a nuclear weapon. And some of the things people don't understand is, uh, you know, you, any nuclear weapon, any nuclear weapon, even a crude, low-yield nuclear weapon, can make a catastrophic EMP attack. You don't need a high-yield, sophisticated weapon. At a height of burst of 30 kilometers or higher, you, that's uh, you can get a EMP event that would be very significant and uh, potentially catastrophic. At 30 kilometers, you could cover uh, all of New England, all of New York, and half of Pennsylvania, and that would cause cascading failures through the whole eastern grid and basically take us down as a society. The higher the burst height, the greater the coverage of the EMP field. So if you go to 400 kilometers over the center of the country with a, uh, with a missile, for example, uh, as practiced by Iran in, uh, uh, in satellite launches that it has done, uh, you could, uh, you know, you could put an EMP field over the whole country. Iran has also practiced launching uh, ballistic missiles off a of freighter, and you could do it that way. And keep your fingerprints off the attack too. You could launch a Scud missile, for example, off a of freighter, or a Shahab three missile off a of freighter in the Gulf of uh, Mexico near New Orleans, and uh, and do an EMP attack. And because the missile isn't coming from Iran, it's just coming from from a, an unidentified vessel someplace out in the Caribbean, who made the attack. It's a way of making a catastrophic attack, killing millions of people and keeping your fingerprints off, off the genocidal murder. Now, there are nuclear weapons of special design called super EMP weapons that uh, Russia and China have developed. Uh, they talk about them, they write about them in their military doctrine. Uh, these are low-yield weapons because they're not designed to make a big explosion. They're designed to make gamma rays, which is what causes the EMP effect. Uh, and again, they're very low yield. They look like tactical nuclear weapons in their yield, but they're so powerful that they would be even much more effective than a normal nuclear weapon in, uh, in uh, generating a catastrophic EMP. The higher the field strength, basically, the higher your confidence you can be that you're going to eliminate that actor from the world stage, whether it's the United States, Israel, or Western Europe. Uh, 
the voltages for a super EMP weapon in open sources are like 200 volt kilovolts per meter. That's 200,000. So if your car is, say, four meters long, multiply four times 200,000. That's 800,000 volts that's inserted into your automobile at the speed of light. Imagine all the energy going into all the communications cables and the high power lines that run for kilometers and kilometers, hundreds of thousands of kilometers over this country, and multiply that by 200,000. That's how much energy is going into the system. North Korea now has nuclear-armed missiles. That is the judgment of all the intelligence agencies. We know they've been working on nuclear weapons since the 1990s. And the EMP commission on which I served was told by top Russian EMP scientists that technology was transferred from Russia to North Korea for super EMP weapons, that it was accidental, they claim. Although I suspect it was not accidental, but they were just telling us about it to keep their fingerprints off of it. So North Korea probably has super EMP weapons, and the three nuclear tests they've conducted have all looked suspiciously like super EMP weapons. The Western press has sort of described it because they were all low-yield tests, uh, some of them down around one, three kilotons. Uh, you know, but that's about the yield of a super EMP weapon, which again is not designed to create a big explosion to put out gamma rays. South Korean military intelligence, independently of the EMP commission, uh, also uh, concluded that the Russian scientists were in South North Korea helping them develop super EMP weapons. And last year, uh, 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 in 2012, uh, China, a Chinese military commentator, stated that North Korea has got super EMP weapons. And don't forget, North Korea just in April, was threatening to destroy the United States, threatening to make nuclear attacks on the United States uh, just this year. Uh, they, the point is that uh, th those are not hollow uh, threats. They probably could do it. Iran has demonstrated a capability to launch an EMP attack from a vessel at sea. And, you know, it has uh, practiced launching a ballistic missile off a freighter, you know, which is one of the EMP Commission's nightmare scenario, anonymous EMP attack I was talking about before, where they would launch a short-range missile off a freighter. They've also demonstrated the ability to fuse their missiles at high altitude for EMP. And Iranian military writings uh, have explicitly described eliminating the United States as an actor of the world stage by means of EMP attack. It is why Iran wants the bomb. Now in this context, does the Geneva Interagreement save us from this possibility? Is it going to result in a nuclear disarmed Iran? Uh, I respectfully think that this is not the case. I think this is a false hope, uh, a fantasy, in fact. Um, I agree with the uh, Israeli uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, who declared this a historic mistake. Um, some of my reasons, let's look at the technical provisions uh, of the agreement, uh, you know, which is uh, as to why this agreement will not result in a nuclear disarmed Iran. For one thing, Iran will, is allowed to retain control of its 20 which is almost weapons grade. It doesn't take many more cycles through centrifuges to make that we material weapons grade. Uh, Iran has agreed, the press often mistakenly reports that Iran has agreed to destroy its 20% enriched uranium, but this is not true. It has agreed to mix it and turn it into uranium oxide, but this is reversible. You can chemi chemically recover that, and it would also only have a delay in getting back that uranium to use for weapons. Uh, Iran uh, has retained the right in, under the interim agreement to enrich uranium, which is an enormous rever reversal. The official position of the United Nations over years has been Iran does not have the right to enrich uranium. But the interim agreement appears to implicitly open the door to Iran to hope that it will be allowed to enrich uranium. In fact, Iran has publicly declared that its interpretation of the interim agreement is that it has the right to enrich, which basically amounts to the same thing as saying it has the right to make nuclear weapons. Further technical provisions. Under the agreement, Iran, contrary to what is often reported in the press, will continue to build the Iraq nuclear reactor. It is only prohibited from doing things like putting in fuel rods, which is only what you do at the end of building the nuclear reactor, the final stage. They're still building that reactor, and for the next six months, we'll continue to build it so they can breed plutonium for nuclear weapons. And UN inspectors will only be allowed at a few facilities that are already known to be part of Iran's nuclear program. Many facilities, the most important facilities, like the big Hutz underground facility, is probably where most of Iran's nuclear weapons program is, and they're not going to be allowed to inspect that. So they may be able to halt doing things on nuclear weapons or slow them down at some of the inspected facilities, but they could be going all out elsewhere, for example, at Cuts. And I suspect that this is exactly what they're going to be doing. 
you know, because this is what North Korea did. Basically, Iran has taken a, play, a page from the North Korean playbook and negotiated with the United States. Everybody seems to have forgotten the Clinton administration's agreed framework, which promised peace in our time with North Korea, that North Korea would never become a nuclear weapon state. Under eight years of the Clinton administration, and under the Bush administration too, they were engaged in these negotiations with North Korea to try to get North Korea to give up the bomb and agree to denuclearize, and North Korea was not sincerely negotiating. It was pretending to be a negotiating partner. Well, it was going all out to perfect its missiles and perfect its nuclear weapons, so where it's now in a position today where it probably has super EMP weapons and probably can reach the United States by orbiting them as a satellite on its space launch vehicle the way it practiced in December 2012. So it can credibly threaten to make an uh, attack. We've come a long way with North Korea, haven't we? Where the agreed framework under the Clinton administration was supposed to disarm them, and now they are making credible nuclear threats to attack the United States as recently as April 2013. My friends, this is exactly the same pathway we're going with Iran. I mean, the interim agreement, the interim, interim, interim agreement is very similar to what we did with North Korea. And worst of all, it may be that Iran already has the bomb. When North Korea was negotiating with us, they already had the bomb. We assessed that they had the bomb in uh, 1994. And uh, that's when the uh, Clinton administration began negotiations with them. Uh, just think of a few facts. It only took the United States three years to develop nuclear weapons during World War II. Iran's supposedly been working on the bomb for 25 years. And they've had help from Russia, China, North Korea. And uh, don't forget the Iranians and the North Koreans have a scientific and missile treaty where they cooperate. Iranian scientists have been present at all three North Korean nuclear tests. Perhaps one of those North Korean nuclear tests was also with an Iranian weapon. I'm not alone in this opinion. Uh, listed on this view graph, you know, people like Dr. William Graham, who was President Reagan's science advisor, Fritz Ehrmarth, Chair of Council, Jim Woolsey, former director of the CIA, all of them. Uh, as recently as last Friday, I was in a meeting with Jim Woolsey where he, he said, you know, Iran may well already have nuclear weapons. Former CIA operative Reza Khalili uh, has reported that Russia provided tactical nuclear weapons to Iran, that Iran is building nuclear weapons on its own. And the Russians themselves said so in June 9, 2002. One of their highest ranking military officers, officers in June 2002 said then that Iran had the bomb. That's when we were just starting to suspect that Iran might have a nuclear weapons program. Now, our Russian friends are also exporting to rogue states the Club K missile system, which is designed to look just like a, uh, a container, a shipping container, so it can convert any freighter into a launch platform for a, a nuclear attack, including an EMP attack. And Ar Iran has purchased Club K, the Club K system. Our research has also found that uh, Iran, North Korea, Pakistan, uh, they all have widespread knowledge of EMP, and, and their military right describe making EMP attacks, including against the United States, uh, except for Pakistan. Pakistan knows about it, but its primary focus is uh, India. But Iran and North Korea, uh, their enemies are, uh, Iran's enemy is Israel and the United States, and North Korea is, uh, is focused on the United States. Uh, EMP attack fits into jihadist ideology. Uh, in their open source military writings, you know, they the uh, Islamic tradition of not harming women and children and not killing fellow Muslims, they can justify that by EMP because EMP does not directly kill people. It only indirectly kill pe kills people by starving them to death and denying them from food and water and exposing them to disease and anarchy. And the rationalization here among the, uh, among the jihadis uh, in their ideology is that, is that uh, because the West has elevated technology to the status of a god, and we have lived this materialist, corrupt lifestyle and turned our back on imperialism, that in effect, an EMP attack is a form of divine justice because we're being killed by our own sins. Our technology being so crucial to our lives and this materialism being so crucial to our lives is what makes us vulnerable to EMP, and so, and so we deserve to die. If we lived their kind of lifestyle, uh, you know, uh, we wouldn't be vulnerable to this attack. Some of the strategic advantages are an EMP attack gives you the biggest bang for the buck. You know, it's the only kind of an option where you could use a single nuclear weapon basically to win the war against the United States. You could launch this thing outside of U.S. territory on a vessel, as I described before. Uh, you know, why not use it in the city? 
Uh, terrorists might attack a city, they might do it that way, but why do that and kill 200,000 people with fallout when you could kill 200 million or almost 300 million Americans if 9, in, nine of 10 die uh, by means of an EMP attack? And uh, also, you have to be concerned about if you to a city, you know, to do the, an attack that way, what if they decide to betray you? You know, and they call up the FBI and say, I've got an atomic bomb, do you have a million dollars? If you do the MP attack off a ship, you don't have to go into U.S. territorial waters, and you can have security on that ship to ensure that nobody betrays the operation. The likelihood of an EMP attack. Well, it only took a few months for North Korea to go from demonstrating the capability to orbit a satellite, you know, which could, which could be a, a super EMP weapon if they wanted it to be, to threatening to make attacks to destroy the United States and its allies. So the threat from North Korea is very high. You know, in my judgment, if, if Iran has nuclear weapons now or if it gets nuclear weapons in the future, I think inevitably they're going to make uh, uh, an EMP attack against us because they are motivated by religion, reasons that have to do with their religious eschatology, uh, their belief in the worldwide triumph of Islam and bringing back the 12th Imam, not reasons, not for reasons that have anything to do with money or traditional balance of power politics. Uh, they are they're going to do it because... Uh, uh, because their ideology drives them to do it. Just the way Nazi Germany was driven by its ideology to do things that were so horrific that the West could not comprehend them and didn't believe it was possible. Now, it, there's no excuse for the United States to be vulnerable to EMP. The Department of Defense has known for 50 years how to protect systems, and the EMP Commission on which I serve developed a plan to protect our critical infrastructures, again, including the electric grid against EMP. There are things like Faraday cages and uh, blocking devices and surge arresters that can be used to protect the electric grid and our other critical infrastructures. The cost is modest. The EMP Commission estimated it would only cost $2 billion, a one-time investment of $2 billion, which is what we give to foreign aid to Pakistan every year. This to protect our electric grid. If the costs were passed on to consumers, it would increase everybody's electric bill by just 20 cents annually. You know, unfortunately, uh, we are still not protected against DMP, and Congress is trying hard to do it. Why? Because we're resisted by the electric power industry. The bad guy in this scenario in terms of our domestic enemies is the North American Electric Reliability Corporation, which is the lobby for the electric power industry. You know, they are trying, they have blocked every effort by Congress to pass a bill that would empower the U.S. Federal Energy Regulatory Commission to require them to protect the grid. You know, what you can do is write your congressman, your senator, tell them to support the SHIELD Act. The SHIELD Act, which is currently blocked in the House Energy and Commerce Committee, being prevented from coming to a vote. If the SHIELD Act passes, it will put in place the legal authorities to require the electric power industry to protect our national electric grid. Also, consider launching initiatives at the state level. All the solutions don't have to come from Washington. Maine got tired of the state of Maine got tired of waiting for Washington, and they just passed a bill this year, LD151 to protect their own state electric grid from EMP. They may be the first state in the United States to, to do that. Uh, North Carolina is close behind and wants to uh, launch its own state-led EMP initiative, and as, as is the state of Oklahoma. So you could try to do this at the state level. State public utilities commissions actually have more legal authorities than exist at the federal level to require grid protection. And don't forget what you can do in your personal life, too. In these books, uh, they describe everything I've been telling to you and more in much greater detail, but also there are things that you can do in your community, in your, in your family. There, this doesn't have to be at the state level. Every family can do something to help get prepared against EMP and other large-scale catastrophic threats. Have a food supply, have a water supply, have a plan, just in case there's going to be a protracted blackout about what your family can do, what your community can do to make yourselves safer. Maybe you should plant a little garden. Maybe community when they spend money, for example, on, uh, on, uh, on, on flower gardens and things, maybe should, they should think about planting fruit, fruit trees and things of that sort. If every fire department and every police department bought a, a siphon for $25, they would be able to access the gasoline supplies trapped at gas stations so you wouldn't completely lose police and emergency services. Extend the, uh, the amount of fuel available to emergency generators at hospitals. So there's all kinds of things people can do to get prepared on their own. Uh, my parents' generation, the Great Generation, had lived through World War II, they'd seen Pearl Harbor, and experienced the Great Depression. All of them were survivalists, whether they were Republican or Democrat back in those days. 
not only would they have survived an EMP attack, they were ready for anything, they probably would have enjoyed the experience. And there's no reason why rugged individualism and self-sufficiency, why these virtues can't come back to America again so that we can protect our families, our communities, and our country. I thank you for allowing me the opportunity to talk to you about this, uh, this li still little known, but a vitally important threat, a threat which is uh, imminent to our civilization. Dr. Pry, it's Ryan Morrow again. Uh, thank you very much for that wonderful presentation. I even learned uh, quite a bit from it, and I study this type of problem all the time. Um, and we document it quite frequently at clarionproject.org. We've got some questions from the audience that were sent in that we'd like to pose to you. Uh, but the first question is going to come from me. I was wondering if you could kind of give us um, a rundown of President Obama's record on this issue and let us know if there are any politicians on both sides of the aisle who we should praise and support um, for taking action on this threat. Yes, uh, I will praise President Obama. Uh, he has done more than any other president to uh, <clears throat> advance national EMP preparedness. His presidential policy directive and presidential policy directive 21 uh, both look like they were following the lead of the Congressional EMP Commission on which I served to try to implement some of its recommendations. Unfortunately, even the White House doesn't have the legal authority to, to compel the, uh, the private sector to protect the electric grid communication systems and, and things of that, uh, of that sort. Uh, and uh, President Obama's science advisor in 2010 uh, wrote an uh, op-ed for the New York Times uh, called Celestial Storm Warnings, warning about the, uh, the threat from the natural EMP threat from the sun. Um, uh, this is a bipartisan issue, by the way, and it's not a Republican or a Democrat thing. It's one of the few, you know, rarely hear from the media when the Republicans and Democrats on the far wings of their party have closed ranks uh, to try to get the country protected and do what they can. Back in 2010, when the House was controlled uh, by uh, uh, 20, 2009 and 2010, when uh, the House was controlled by the Democrats, it was who took the lead, one of the most liberal members of the House, and he, he was advancing the GRID Act which was designed to try to protect the electric grid. And it was supported unanimously by everybody in the House, very aggressively too, by people like Representative Trent Franks and Roscoe Bartlett, some of the most conservative members of Congress. Now the Republicans have the House, they've been trying to get the SHIELD Act passed. And they also enjoy this bi broad bipartisan support. In fact, there's even a congressional EMP caucus that has bipartisan leadership. It's chaired by Representative Franks, one of the most conservative members of Congress, and Yvette Clark one of the most liberal members of Congress. There's a united front on this issue. Unfortunately, despite all of this political support in Congress, and despite efforts by the desire by the White House to, to make progress, you know, Washington is just so broken because of the power of these lobbyists. All they have to do is buy one or two key members on a committee, and they can stop a bill from coming to the floor. And that's what's happened here. If people don't get angry and tell their Congress the EMP caucus, support the SHIELD Act, you know, Washington will continue to fail to uh, to protect us against this threat. Thank you. Um, as for the nuclear deal with Iran, I think you've pointed out some really major and concerning loopholes in the deal. Um, but if we were to look for something positive in that deal, would it be possible to argue that at least this delays the day when Iran could possibly get a nuclear weapon? Because we've heard one of the defenses of the deal being that Iran was racing towards getting critical nuclear breakout capacity in about six months, and that even if this deal is flawed, it still buys us some time. So does this deal actually buy us any time? I don't think it does. I think the you can only believe that it buys us time if you think that our intelligence on Iran's nuclear program is largely accurate and that we know most everything about Iran's nuclear program. Because the calculations that it buys us time assumes that Iran doesn't already have the bomb. It, Iran, it, it assumes that, uh, that Iran doesn't have secret facilities, for example, at that underground facility at Quds and elsewhere, and that they are not following the North Korean example and hiding most of their nuclear weapons program for us so that they can go forward very aggressively uh, and all we can see is just the tip of the iceberg. So I think that that's a real misconception. In fact, I think that that, that, is, uh, that attitude is one of the things I fear most about this deal, that it will create the same kind of complacency uh, in the West that we had about the agreed framework. 
because then people assumed that we know, knew most everything about the North Korean program. And it turned out to be false. I mean, I served on the North Korean Advisory Group when I was in Congress, and we were trying to tell anybody who would listen that our intelligence was poor on the North Korean program, but we did know that they had hidden a lot of it. And we knew, for example, that they had a secret in uranium enrichment uh, uh, but the press wouldn't listen to us. Nobody would listen to us. They, we also knew they were working aggressively to develop ICBMs. And now here we are with a nuclear missile armed Iran, uh, North Korea and, uh, and, uh, that seems to be irreversible and uh, a very dangerous state that, is, that just months after it orbited its satellite is threatening to attack us. And we're on that same pathway to, toward Iran. So I don't, have, I don't think that's a legitimate argument that it, at least it slows it down and, and, uh, and it's better for us to be talking because it didn't slow down the North Koreans either. And talking with uh, the negotiations, when you're negotiating with a partner who's lying to you, who's not a sincere negotiating partner, all you're doing is being like Neville Chamberlain. You're burying your head in the sand and, 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 and kicking the can down the road to some day in the future when, when they might launch an attack out, uh, on you out of surprise. You know, uh, these opinions uh, and these analysis that I have shown you where some believe that Iran already has the bomb, will not find those in the mainstream media. You know, someone like Ambassador Woolsey, former CIA director, believes that, and yet this is ignored by the mainstream media. You know, complacency uh, is, uh, is one of the most dangerous things that Western democracies face. We should have learned that from World War II. One of the, well, two of the questions that we, at, we received were about electronics and nuclear power plants. If an EMP goes off, are all electronics fried or just the ones that are plugged into the wall? How does that work? And also, what happens to nuclear power plants after an EMP goes off? Uh, it depends on the location of the, a piece of electronic device. Uh, any kind of electronics can be vulnerable and can be destroyed, but it depends how big they are, where they're located, are they in a protected facility. A lot of the military electronics, for example, are underground and are, are in protected facilities. It can depend on the orientation. Uh, for example, an automobile that's facing into the wave, so the smaller part of the automobile is facing the EMP wave, might survive. But if that same automobile were t uh, oriented in a different way, if it hit, got hit side on, it, would, it might be destroyed. So 100% um, of everything doesn't get destroyed. Uh, uh, it's random where the damage occurs, but the damage will be massive and, uh, and uh, enough to cause the collapse of critical infrastructures. Um, what, happens to, uh, what happens to nuclear power plants? Good question. Uh, what happens to nuclear power plants is what happened to Fukushima. You know, our nuclear reactors are, uh, uh, they only have an emergency power supply that would last, you know, a few days. Um, uh, emergency generators have to be resupplied with gasoline or, or, or diesel fuel uh, that's trucked in. And if, if the trucks don't work, if the pipelines don't work, they're not going to be getting that. And what happened is the batteries failed, they weren't able to have fuel for the emergency generators, and eventually the, uh, the reactors, within a matter of days, they melted down, they overheated, they uh, expelled radioactive uh, 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 clouds uh, you know, that were very threatening to the populations. And uh, that just happened at a few reactors at Fukushima. You know, we've got over 100 reactors in the United States that could cause vast swaths of the country to be destroyed and, uh, uh, you know, with radioactivity as a consequence of an EMP attack. Okay, thank you. The next question that we received is about how the U.S. could militarily respond after an EMP attack. Um, we're assuming that some military assets would survive and that some of them are hardened. What would the role of the military be in responding to an EMP attack? Or would they just be too busy trying to hold the country together? What's left of it? I think they'd be too busy trying to hold the country together uh, uh, because the uh, Department of Defense also has a role. And uh, the choice would be between coming to rescue the lives of hundreds of millions of Americans to try to save our society or, uh, uh, you know, or, or focusing our attentions on, on revenge. Um, but even before that, you have to ask the question, against whom would we retaliate? Uh, in order to retaliate, you have to know who made the attack in the first place. And that's exactly what Iran and North Korea have been practicing to do. That's what this, this attack by means of satellite, for example, uh, would do. You know, we lose 
uh, it's a very subtle mode of attack because the, the space launch vehicle is launched over the South Pole. We lo it looks like it's going south. It looks like it's a peaceful satellite. You have to be able to connect two and two that after, after that launch, there was an EMP burst. Well, what if it's done from a freighter, for example, off the coast? Anybody could do That could be anybody. It could be North Korea. It could be Hezbollah or terrorists on their own. And by the way, this year, just this year, uh, there was a North Korean freighter trying to exit the Pan go through the Panama Canal. We thought it was smuggling drugs, but we found two SA-2 nuclear-capable missiles on that, in the hold of that freighter on their launchers, a North Korean freighter. Now, it didn't have nuclear weapons on it, but it's just very interesting that North Korea was playing the nightmare scenario. That was the nightmare EMP scenario. What are they doing? Is that a practice run to see if they could smuggle nuclear-capable missiles down into the Caribbean? Uh, is it possible that a country like Russia might be contract with Iran or North Korea to do a proxy nuclear attack against us. So it's not clear that we would even know who attacked us so that we could retaliate. There are ways of doing it to keep your fingerprints off the attack. And, and uh, uh, now we would have the capability to retaliate. We would have the military capability to retaliate because our strategic nuclear forces are hardened against EMP. I mean, DOD is the best protected part of our society where EMP is concerned. But it's not clear that we would even be able to retaliate. Because you have to know who you're retaliating against. And, uh, and also, retaliation, uh, uh, a lot of people think, well, could we do, if we can retaliate, then we can deter the attack, can't we? Well, not necessarily. It depends on the ideology of your adversary. I mean, the, uh, the mullahs in Iran uh, celebrate the use of children as suicide bombers. And uh, uh, they see themselves as having a transcendental mission that goes beyond nation states and beyond this world. You know, their whole country, once they are armed with nuclear weapons, maybe they're already armed with nuclear weapons. We should think of it as a giant nuclear truck bomb coming our way. Okay, and final question. Um, I think that most Americans have really given up hope on Congress. If you look at the approval rating, it's, it's rock bottom. And so when it comes to having a national solution, people are naturally going to be pessimistic. But when you talked about activism on the state level, having state legislation, I think that's what's going to give a lot of people of people that are listening to this webinar are going to say, that's something I can get involved in. So what is the first step to getting involved in pushing for legislation on the state level in order to protect someone's state from an EMP attack? I agree with you. Uh, it's the state level activism that's given me hope, because we've been trying for five years uh, to try to get the recommendations of the EMP uh, com Commission implemented through Washington, and for five years we've been unsuccessful. Uh, even though we've got the majority support of the Congress and we've got support in the White House because the lobbyists are so effective and Washington is so broken. But the step to get the ball rolling in, 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 uh, in the states is to find a representative, find a state representative, write to them, call to them, try to get them interested, try to get them to introduce a, an initiative. That's how it's happened in the state of Maine. It started with one state representative her name, who's a liberal Democrat named Andrea Boland. And she got tired of waiting for Washington. She was very and she's the one that picked up the ball and, uh, and ran with it in Maine. At first, everybody thought she was crazy. But my task force and other EMP experts went up there to Maine, and we educated the Maine State Legislature and their Joint Energy Committee on it. And, uh, and in three months, uh, you know, they passed that bill, and they're on their way to becoming the first state in the United States to be protected against EMP. It restores your hope in, 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 in our republic to show, see that common sense is not dead, that it is possible to make progress at the, at the level of the states. And you can do it in your communities, too. And as I mentioned before, individuals and every family, everybody can be part of the solution. You know, everybody should have a food supply. You should have a medicine kit. Generic preparedness for, for, for catastrophes, whether they're hurricanes or tornadoes, or, or a protracted blackout caused by an ice storm, that same kind of preparedness is the same survive an EMP event, except think of it as an even more protracted catastrophe that could last months or years. You know, teach your kids how to hunt and fish, have a little garden, you know, and, uh, and, and recapture those virtues of rugged individualism and self-sufficiency that made this country great. Uh, if we have those, if most of our people still had those kinds of kinds of characteristics like my father's generation had. The great generation that survived World War II and the Great Depression will come out okay. 
All right. Thank you very much for your time, Dr. Pry. Thank you, everyone, for attending this webinar. We look forward to uh, communicating with you, Dr. Pry, in the future. And those of you that have tuned into this webinar, uh, let us know what you're doing in your own state in order to protect uh, not just your state but the country from this EMP threat. Make sure you sign up for our newsletter at clarionproject.org so you can keep updated on this threat and what people around the country are doing in order to confront this Congress is not. Thank you again for all of your time. Uh, my name is Ryan Morrow, and we look forward to hearing from all of you in the future. Have a happy holiday. <laughs>